Welcome to all. This is the first lesson in our series on the book of 1 Peter, which has been called a condensed resume of the faith. The book is a model of pastoral instruction for those who live, as we say, in between the times, in the tension of a salvation already accomplished and not yet consummated, and in the face of serious cultural hostility, which makes it a book uniquely relevant, I think, to our current moment. The author, of course, is Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and thus authorized by Christ himself to instruct and to comfort the church. He writes somewhere around 63 AD from the city of Rome, where he was, according to tradition, martyred just a few years later. Rome is symbolically called Babylon at the end of the letter, just as it is called Babylon throughout the book of Revelation. So it is from Rome, from Babylon, the capital of the empire, to a people also living under the dominion of the Roman beast that Peter writes. In these opening verses, we will make two points. Two points, exiles and election. Exiles and election. First, then exiles. After identifying himself, Peter begins. To God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Notice first that whether these are Roman provinces or just regions, the letter is a general, widely distributed letter, what we would today call a Catholic epistle. Peter writes not merely to one church, but to a wide geographical swath of believers across what is today a portion of Turkey. And this gives the book a kind of universal feel. It's not bogged down in the local issues of any one congregation. And the Christians to whom he writes are, note, scattered throughout these provinces. The word for scattered is the word we get diaspora from, a term used of the Jews in exile, scattered from their homeland. Now, while there is some debate here, Peter is most likely using the term metaphorically of Christians living, if you will, in Babylon, away from their heavenly homeland. And he's writing to a predominantly Gentile audience. These are people we know from the rest of the book who formerly lived in ignorant passions, who are said to have inherited a feudal way of life from their forefathers, something unlikely to be said by Peter of his Jewish heritage. These are people who have previously indulged in pagan sensuality, drunkenness, orgies, and general debauchery, which Jews would have found abhorrent. These are people whose neighbors are shocked when they cease to live a life of immoral dissipation, which would be true of Gentiles, but perhaps not of Jews. And finally, we're told in chapter 2 that these are a people who were not the people of God and now are the people of God. They had not received mercy, but now they have received mercy. This is an allusion, of course, to Hosea chapters 1 and 2, and it originally speaks of the restoration of rebellious Israel. But Paul in Romans chapter 9 extends the Hosea text to the calling of the Gentiles, and it would appear that Peter is doing the same thing here. Thus, on balance, the evidence is that Peter is writing to a predominantly, though perhaps not exclusively, Gentile audience. And Peter, as the New Testament does elsewhere, appropriates the language that the Old Testament applies to Israel to the church. For the church is the renewal of Israel. She is the Israel of God. So diaspora then refers to the scattered church, scattered away from her true homeland, and it is qualified, qualified and interpreted by the word exiles. Exiles scattered. Exile is a key theme in the epistle and it is a key motif of Christian existence. The word for exiles here means transients or foreigners. Now, Peter will use another word a little later that means something like resident alien. But this word here, exiles, is lighter and more vaporous. It means people passing through. Vagabonds, visiting foreigners, sojourners. 
So you could read it, transience of the scattering, transience of the diaspora. That is how Peter designates the church. Resident alien stresses that we are living away from our true home. Transient stresses that we are wayfarers, sojourners on the way to our true home. And clearly, the ideas are closely related. So let's unpack this a little. There are two related reasons for this exile sentiment found here <coughs> throughout the Holy Scriptures. First, the mere brevity, the vaporizing shortness of life. The whole book of Ecclesiastes is taken up with it, but let's use Psalm 39 as an example. Psalm 39 says this, Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my days a mere hand breath. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath. Surely everyone goes around like a mere phantom. Then note, the psalmist says this, For I dwell with you as an alien, a stranger. Now get this, listen. I dwell with you as an alien, a stranger, as all my fathers were. All Israel dwells with God as strangers. Because, at least in the rationale of Psalm 39, all human beings are vaporizing puffs of smoke. We are not home until we are in immortal, deathless glory. In 1 Chronicles 29, David, the king, now he's in the land now, prays for the gifts given to build the temple. And he says this, We are aliens in your sight, as were all our forefathers. Our days on earth are like a shadow. Thus everyone, David affirms, all our fathers, everyone is a stranger, a pilgrim, a wayfarer. Now, a second biblical reason for this exile sentiment, and this brings us closer to what Peter is getting at here, can be seen from Leviticus 25. Leviticus 25 says this, The land must not be sold permanently, because the land is mine, and you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. So the land is the Lord's. Israel exists in it as tenants, as strangers, foreigners. Thus the psalmist could say to God, you are my portion, my inheritance, Lord. Now this language of portion reflects the state of the Levites in Israel. They did not get a land inheritance. The Lord said to them, I am your share. But, and this is important, right? The Levites dramatized the reality of all Israelites. They were all but temporary tenants in the land. Strangers before the Lord, even in Canaan, even in the land which typified their inheritance. So, for example, we would read then in Psalm 119, the psalmist, who is not in exile, political exile, geographic exile, he's not in Egypt, but who's in the promised land says, I am a stranger, a sojourner on earth. So, let's put it this way. As Israel was strangers, transients in the land, so the church, scattered here throughout Roman Babylon, is a body of transients in the earth. Right? So we are exiles because we are away from and sojourners on the way to our true homeland, which as we shall see throughout this series, is heaven itself. It is the triune God whose glory fills the highest heavens. Israel's inheritance was the land. Peter will say in verse 4 that our inheritance, and inheritance is a land term, remember, our inheritance is heaven. So here's the key thing to see. The land is a type, an Old Testament picture of heaven, and thus of the eschaton. This is the reason for so much hymnody in the church about crossing the Jordan crossing over into Canaan, being associated with dying. I think the scriptural reasons for this kind of hymnody, the instincts behind it, are profound. They're solid. So consider the following then. Consider the following. The Old Testament land was Israel's country, their nation. Hebrews 11 tells us 
that the saints then and Christians now desire a better country that is a heavenly one, right? Our country, our land is heavenly. What else made the land the land? Well, the city of Jerusalem. But the New Testament teaches us that our Jerusalem is the Jerusalem above, the heavenly city. Mount Zion was in the land. But now Mount Zion is what we have come to when we are lifted up into heaven, according to Hebrews 12. The sanctuary, with its holy of holies, was the centerpiece of the land, but we know it was a copy. right? It was a shadow of the heavenly sanctuary. And we know that Jesus has entered that very heavenly holy place in the highest heavens before the face of God. The land was also the place where the Davidic throne was, from which the king reigned. And Jesus has now assumed the Davidic throne in heaven. So the land, the city of Jerusalem, Mount Zion, the sanctuary, and the Davidic throne are all now heavenly realities. And a people oriented to heaven, a people whose life, whose treasure, whose inheritance, whose affections, whose citizenship, whose bridegroom and Lord are in heaven, such a people are, in the nature of the case, transients and exiles in the earth. Now, This may seem to some too otherworldly or perhaps too wispy. I assure you it is not. What is required is a people who think of heaven, a created but presently veiled realm, as more solid, more real, more concrete, more enduring, more powerful, and infinitely more lovely than all the kingdoms of the world. For the immediate glory of our triune God and His Christ are there. <clears throat> so, yet the world, dislodged from its claim, then, to be the center of gravity of our affections, the world is still not left behind here. Peter will call us to soberly witness in the world, to live in it with gritty realism throughout the letter. And he expects for his scattered exiles to be vindicated. He knows that having our inheritance in heaven means that when heaven descends and when the veil between this creation and heaven itself is torn and Jesus appears in visible glory with the burning angelic hosts, with the departed saints, when the heavenly city descends, when the new creation is unveiled, it will heavenize this creation. It will transfigure the current order. That will be the destruction of death. And of all the satanic powers opposing these exiled Christians, it will be the eradication of evil, the resurrection of the dead, the vindication of the martyrs, the rectifying and healing of the whole cosmos. Then, glory, the visible radiance of God, will flood the earth as the waters cover the sea. Then the whole groaning creation will be liberated, lit up, and escalated in splendor by the light of God shining visibly in the face of Jesus Christ. Nothing short of this is the Christian hope, and nothing short of this is the Christian inheritance. Heaven, it turns out, is the epicenter of the new creation. It is where our life is already hidden with Christ and God. And it is the place from which we shall be revealed, seen openly in glory, when Christ's transfigured glory is revealed. The meek may indeed they shall inherit the earth, but until they do, they reside as strangers in it. In the gift of the Spirit, we have a foretaste. We have a down payment, a pledge of this future inheritance, which remains reserved for us in heaven. Having the down payment and yearning for the full inheritance, we live, Peter says, as scattered 
transients, exiles. The second point here is election, election. We are exiles. Nevertheless, we are elect exiles. This is how Peter begins comforting and encouraging these harassed and suffering transients with the doctrine of election. It is this, right? No earthly consolation. This is the root of our dignity. It's the root of our security. And it's the ultimate eternal ground of our hope. We have been chosen, the text says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So being a member of God's people is not determined by blood or by physical descent. They are not all Israel who are from Israel. It is determined by God's electing mercy. Where is the church's anchor? It is in the being of the sovereign and electing God. And foreknowledge here is not merely seeing in advance. It's not God's bare cognition, His bare knowledge of the future. To be known by God is to be loved by God. Through Amos, God says to Israel, You only have I known of all the nations of the earth. It's not like God forgot about the other nations. To be known here means to be loved. To be foreknown is to be loved from all eternity. It's virtually identical with the idea of election. In fact, later in this chapter, Peter will say Christ himself was foreknown before the foundation of the world, which surely means he was loved and chosen by the Father for his messianic mission from all eternity. Whom he foreknew, Paul says, these he predestined. Those who are foreknown by God and those who are predestined are an identical set. To be foreknown, then, is to be elect. These are elect exiles. And this election is made operative. It comes into being in your own life through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Paul says much the same thing in 2 Thessalonians 2. He says, God chose you to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Election is unto holiness. Right? We get this in Ephesians 1 as well. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him. So what is God doing in the earth, <clears throat> in history? He's creating by the Spirit a holy people conformed to the glorious image of His Son for fellowship with Himself, now by faith, later in glory, face to face in a renewed creation. So, our election originates in God the Father. It's made operative in us by the Spirit, and its goal, its object is, the text continues, obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling with His blood. That is, incorporation into the reality of the new covenant in the blood of Christ. This is a beautiful, compact statement of the unified work of the Holy Trinity. The Father chooses, the Son redeems, the Spirit sanctifies. So let us conclude. This is a basic identity statement, this opening foray by the Apostle Peter. It's fundamental to understanding his epistle, and it provides a fundamental orientation for Christian existence in the world. These communities are poor. They're powerless. They're harassed. They're subject to sporadic suffering. Now, while massive empire-wide suffering has not yet been unleashed, they face all sorts of local but real and serious opposition. And to this people, to this people, Peter gives no cheap earthly solace. He insists at the outset on a kind of displacement. 
and alienation. He insists on a heavenly mindedness and a heavenly identity. His opening designation is that they are chosen, scattered, transients, elect exiles. A mindset which is almost completely absent from much of modern American Christianity, right, where we have culture wars and secular politics which occupy much more energy, they evoke much more passion, they consume much more psychological bandwidth, they fray more friendships than any contemplation on our status as sojourners destined for heavenly glory. And for our malady, Peter prescribes this, eternal election unto holiness by the triune God and, and its corresponding exilic status. This, and not any earthly agenda or any particular socio-political outcomes, this is the church's comfort, her assurance, and her hope, even in the face of peril, even in the face of an unraveling culture. It is upon such people, then, it is upon Christian pilgrims, that the apostle pronounces his rich opening benediction, a benediction which contains all the blessings of the gospel, all the teaching about to be unpacked in this letter in miniature. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Amen.